skin, uh, but I think it's better to give you an oral picture about the story of Joe Kukash, who was above a beyond any doubt, the most significant Marxist philosopher of the 20th century. So it was interesting, it would be interesting for you to see the background of his work. So I say I hear a few words about Hungary and particularly Budapest and second before the First World War at the beginning of the 20th century. At the beginning of the 20th century, there was a tendency, a movement among the youth, youth of Hungary, uh, towards turning towards modernism on the one hand and towards modern soci social science on the other hand. The church towards Paris for fine arts, particular painting, but also for poetry, uh, to Germany for philosophy, and to a kind of Marxism in social sciences. The career of these new ideas, all modernist ideas, were basically came from two different kind of backgrounds. One background was the first intellectual Jewish generation in Budapest. The second was the first intellectual generation of the gentry outside Budapest. And the best known names in both categories from the first Jewish intellectuals in Europe, as the George Lukács, and the second, the best known of the second, uh, then the first intellectuals, Bela Bartok, the composer. So the, I think these are the first you all know. Now the tendency was modernist. Hungarians wanted to be modern, young Hungarians wanted to be modern. They organized different kinds of groups, the Sunday group for Lukács, the so-called Daddy Guy Circle for young sociologists, and they wanted to uh, a totally different Hungary than the Hungary that existed at that time, a kind of still feudal Hungary, a Hungary was still half a modernized, half a traditional, half a feudal, half a capitalist. They wanted a totally new world, and in general, they wanted a new world. So I start now with Lukács because Lukács was basically interested in this first time in literary criticism. He criticized through literature the world in which he lived. His parents were very rich people. His father was a self-made man, but was a bankier, a self-made bankier. And he hated basically the whole world of his family. He wanted to get rid of the whole world of his family. He repeated at that time, uh, together with Christians that believe in a world of absolute sinfulness and the complete and sinfulness. The world is a sinful world. So what happens in the world of sin? Everyone knows who knows about Jewish or Christian theology. The world of absolute sinfulness is the world before redemption. That is, all we have to have the redemption. That's a materialistic conception. We live for redemption because we live in the world of complete sinfulness. That was the idea. Last young George Lukács was still in the high school when he published his first literary criticism in the then main Hungarian magazine or journal called The West, Nuba, The West, obviously, of course, it is political, called The West. Everyone wanted to publish in The West, in Nuba, among the Hungarian news. And Lukács still a new school, a high school student, ordered to publish that. He was a very, he was a Young genius, he was regarded at that time, a young genius. Very soon, in his 20s, he, uh, he provided a little book, not that little book, but a competition. Uh, anonymous, no one knew that he was the author. The title was the, the History of Modern Drama. He wrote a history of modern drama, concentrating on those dramatic writers tragedy writers, bazaar tragedy writers, who criticized the modern world, who were critical against the modern world. That first of all, in them, Strindberg, they were the most dramatic writers who were critical against the modern world, who wanted to have a different kind of world than the modern world in which they lived. 
the order that is decided that the most important promise comes not from Western Europe or the Western Europe with modernists, but it comes redemption. Does not come from the rest. Redemption comes from the Lord and the East, but the most redeeming authors for his in his mind were at that time himself from the North, and of course those who escaped from the East. But the Scandinavia and Russia, although it was a modern we believe that modern art comes from the West, but modern redemption, redemption from this kind of modernism, from this kind of ultra modernism comes from the north or comes from the east, it was already to Scandinavia and Russia at the time. It was a very interesting book, I do not know about the explicit in Chinese translation, but it, although it's the first book of Lukács, not yet a Marxist, he refers uh, sometimes also to Karl Marx in making his own proposition about the modern drama. The next book, which was basically um, a proof of a love story, Lukács's love story as a young man, love story with Irma Zeidler, a young man dress who committed later suicide. So, as the influence of this love story, he wrote essays which were, which were collected in the book The Soul and the Forms. This book is in Chinese, The Soul and the Forms. And there are two American publications of this book. Uh, the latest publication with the preface of Judy Butler, if you may know this book. And uh, he wrote a preface to this, uh, this volume, and the preface was on essay. The preface on essay. All these studies were critical, they were addressing itself to different forms of life, and all of them were essays. Now look at this the serial essay, and that was the most first first expression of what contemporary philosophy is all about, should be all about, the first expression of hermeneutical approach in contemporary philosophy. Uh, not theoretical hermeneutics, but how it really works, how hermeneutical address to a work which is not philosophical, which is the work of literature, can be philosophical. That was a great essay on essay. This is why he became immediately a very young man, very famous in the whole world. The essay book, The Soul and the Force, was the favorite book by Thomas Mann and the favorite book by Max Weber. So Max Weber immediately invited Lukács to Edward. And look at the long one of the members of the Max Weber Circle in Heidelberg. Uh, if you go today to Heidelberg and visit the Max Weber house and go to the room where the famous Saturday afternoon parties were organized by Madame Weber, you see that among those who participated at the East, uh, there is the photograph of the very young George Lukács, who was constant, constant participant in this Saturday parties of the Weber, Marian and Max Weber. So that time, that time, although very much influenced by the soul and the courts, Max Weber wanted to persuade Lukács to write a monography because to get a position in German universities, you need to write a monography. And Lukács had another young friend at the time called Ernst Bloch. You know Ernst Bloch, perhaps, and his books. He also later became a Marxist uh, aesthetic and philosopher, uh, Ernst Bloch. Ernst Bloch also wanted to persuade Lukács to write a monography, not just essays. And Lucas started to write a book on aesthetics. This, is, this was lost for many, many decades, discovered only in the early 70s, very shortly before, uh, I think 68, shortly before Lucas died, was it, really found, it was found in a safe of Heidelberg, the Bank of Heidelberg. This is the so called Heidelberg Aesthetics, Heidelberg Aesthetics, a theoretical book on aesthetics. And the other book which followed this was The Philosophy of Art, the two books which Lukács wrote as a very young person. Uh, now, this uh, aesthetic, Heidelberg aesthetic, 
which was written because in manuscript, and which get translated into real writings by George Marsh, uh, who wrote a lecture study on it, I think the Malachats mentioned George Marcus, and he wrote a very long study, a study also about the Heidelberg aesthetics that was became important for us, because later on, as a Marxist, he wrote a general aesthetics, and if you read the Marxist aesthetic, you will immediately recognize the categories of the early aesthetics. Because a person is a person. A personality is a personality. You cannot have two different kinds of souls. Even if your mind, your ideology changes. That was true also about Luca. So that's only one thing about Heidelberg aesthetics. He made the first distinction about men on everyday life. End of every day, a man as an author. He said a man as an, in everyday life is, as he said, human person as a whole. Human person as a whole. But when a man decides to write a novel or paint a picture or whatever, he ceases to be human person as a whole becomes human wholeness, human wholeness, something entirely different. But still, himself was someone else than himself. That's human wholeness. That is, that is a difference between the everyday person and the person in his work. Now, it's a very important distinction. And those who now discuss the matter of Wagner, the person of Wagner, the, uh, the poet, and the opera writer, or, or as far Heidegger as a person, or Heidegger as a philosopher, have to refer to, back to this local chain concept. There is a difference between the person of everyday life and the person in his work. And later on, in his theory of realism, I think many of you refer to it, theory of realism, he makes the distinction basically made first by Engels, speaks about it, the so-called victory of realism, that means, uh, by Engels own, a later on by Lukács, that a person has an idea, has an ideology. But if he writes a book, a good novel, it's not his ideology which will be there presented, but something entirely different. That the word realism, as he says later, uh, has a victory about the ideology, about the word view of the writer. And this is the same thing. Victory of realism against the first which was the Marxist conception and the for other formulations. The uh, human person as a whole and human humanness say, say exactly the same things, but in, in, in different philosophical uh, concepts. They have different philosophical concepts, but the intuition is the same. Now I think of that word world breaks up. Word world, first word world, First world war basically changes the world. I uh, don't want to discuss the first world war. Change the world also about those intellectuals because they started to look at the world in different ways, in very different ways. Lukács was against the war, as Bartok was against the war. Many in young intellectuals, uh, at least what we do, supported the war, but this is another matter. Lukács wrote that uh, during the war, during the war, 1916, the second important book which was well known and it is well known also in China, The Theory of the Nova. The Theory of the Nova was a very, that's a new book. But you see, someone of you will give a, a talk about Lukács and the literary genres. If I uh, read it, I don't know who will give the book. Obviously, first he speaks about novels, drama, in his kind of modern drama, then about novels. Now, Lukács becomes the center point, and from this moment on, Lukács is more interested in novels and then in the drama. That is contrary to young Lukács, more in novels than the drama. So, this is the modern drama. I do not want to tell you what the whole book is all about. But only that he gives basically offers a history of the novel. History of the novel. History of the novel in which he exemplifies the history of the novel from a perspective which is the following. That two, there is a relationship between the soul, again the soul, between the soul and the world. The relationship is the soul and the world. In the traditional novels, the uh, world is the main 
protagonist. It's wrong that I'm the song. But in the modern novel, in the modern novel, the soul is stronger than the world. And exemplification of the soul, which is most important than the world, is of course Flaubert. It's of course Flaubert. Not a Bovary, first and foremost, but Flaubert in general. Flaubert is the kind of novelist, but the soul is more important than the world. If you remember, for example, the portrayal of the revolution of 1948 in Flaubert, you will immediately see what Lukács had here in mind. That was, but the most important is the last, not chapter, last reflection of Dostoevsky. Here comes Lukács' belief and faith in Russia. Dostoevsky is no more a novelist. Dostoevsky is no more living in our own time. Dostoevsky promises redemption, that is the promise of redemption. We have to be redeemed from the world of absolute symbolism. Redemption comes from Russia. It comes from Dostoevsky. He is the he is the author of promises us and a very different world. And this is that's why he says he does is no more a novelist. He is beyond to be a novelist. That the kind of mysticism of Dostoevsky, a religious mysticism, in fact, that mysticism in fact was for Lukács the promise of the new world. As Dostoevsky said, every man is responsible for every other man, but if all men do that, that would be immediately paralyzed on earth. And that was Lukács' famous. Not this sentence. I repeat, every man is responsible for every other man. But if every man knew this, that would be immediately paradise on earth. And this was look at the paradise on earth, which is the promise of Dostoevsky. Now, let's go a little bit now in the history. It was the Hungarian Revolution 1918 against the war, against the war, which was followed by the communist takeover in Hungary in in the spring of 1990. In, in the end of 18, Lukács wrote a paper, Bolshevism as a moral problem, that was the time. That is, and he said that Bolshevism cannot be accepted because of moral reasons. After two months, he entered the Communist Party and became a Bolshevik. Hungary has discussed many, many times how did it happen. It's not important for you. The important for you is that it became communist, and as a member of the communist directory of the Hungarian Commune, after the defeat of the Commune, he had to flee Hungary and never return to Hungary prior to 1946, that he left Hungary first to Vienna and then to Germany. That he wrote one of his most important Marxist books. I think other people say talk about it, history of class consciousness. That is, a, I think, the only really Marxist philosophy written, ever written. But anyway, if someone else will speak about it, it's, it's not my topic today. That he wrote it in, in, he became a functionary, and for many years he did not write anything after history of class consciousness because Lenin said that's a wrong book. And because Lenin said that's a wrong book, he immediately exercised self criticism. And for many decades, he hadn't written anything. Only after 33, because Hitler came to power, he had to leave Germany. So he left Germany for the Soviet Union.